Hi, it's a quick analysis of Carolyn Duffy's Wintering, which for my money is one of the best poems in the anthology. There's loads of material in here, um, so much so that um, I can't cover it all in the course of this revision video. Uh, what I'll do is have a look at the structure and have a look at the first three stanzas. And then hopefully you can apply that understanding to the rest of the poem as well. Okay, first of all the title, Wintering. Obviously, Winter itself has fairly negative connotations, it's associated with cold, and in this case probably cold as in an emotional cold. But look at the fact that it's written in the present continuous tense, wintering, it's as if this is ongoing, this state of being cold and emotionless. And it looks like it's being applied to the relationship that uh, Duffy's persona is in. In terms of the structure, the whole poem is composed of tersets, so you've got these regular three-line stanzas going all the way through the poem. And also the meter's regular as well. We've got iambic pentameter followed by iambic dimeter, iambic pentameter. And again, that's replicated right across the poem. So regularity in terms of tersets, regularity in terms of the meter. We've got to ask ourselves then what that regularity might be used to represent. And presumably it's the regularity of this relationship. It's ongoing, this constant relationship. However, another interesting point is that uh, the poem is dominated by half rhymes. We have a regular rhyme scheme, again that regularity, A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 etc. But the rhymes aren't always full. If we take a look at the second stanza, grey fades to black, the stars begin their lies, nothing to lose. I wear a shroud of clothed, clo uh, cold beneath my clothes. It's nearly there, but not quite. There's something awkward and wrong about it. And that's perhaps to represent what's wrong about the relationship. Yes, it's continuing. Yes, it's regular. But there's some, something awkward and wrong about it. And it's that, you know, the, the love isn't always there. There's something wrong about the partnership. We'll have a look at um, the actual language now. Uh, one of the things to recognise is that there is a lot of figurative language here. If we take a look at uh, the first stanza, perhaps the first thing to recognise is the use of prophetic fallacy. This keys back to the title of the poem, Wintering Again, because we've got all day, slow funerals have ploughed the rain. Rain associated with sorrow, associated with quite negative emotions. And if we have a look, that's reinforced by other devices as well, like the sejura after the first two words. The sejura created by the comma creates a slowing down of the pace of the poem, which is reinforced by the word slow that follows it. So we have something quite turgid, slow, something dragging on, and in the face of that rain, this is really quite negative. On the third line, the word trick comes from the semantic field of duplicity, and we see this an awful lot in the poem. This idea of things being tricks, things being deceitful, lies, they come up again and again, and again, probably because that's being applied to the nature of the relationship. This is a relationship that's built on lies and deceit. It begins with, we've done it again, turning love to pain. It seems like this is a cycle. They're in a relationship based on love, but pain is created on the basis of it. Things aren't right with the relationship, something that's heralded by those uh, use of half rhymes. And again, it might be worth turning to line 34 towards the end of the poem, where pain turns back again to love. You get a sense of it being circular. There's a sense of the poem returning in a cycle, a bit like the seasons. Going on to the second stanza, we can see a variety of um, devices being employed. I just want to focus on these three, the use of symbolism, personification and metaphor. And I've given you a breakdown of the kind of way you could respond to that. The connotations of grey and black may be being used by Duffy to symbolise the nature of the relationship described in the poem. Grey connotes boredom and lifelessness, but she describes a process of change as grey fades to black. This is ominous as black connotes death. It could symbolise the fading love and ultimate death of the relationship. Stars begin their lies suggest that, as well as having symbolic significance, the colours could represent the move from evening to night. 
The personification of the stars is confusing, but the concept of things often associated with romance, lying, undermines their usual connotations and makes them once again ominous. And we've got to remember that uh, stars are often associated with um, nighttime romance. It's a beautiful thing, rather like moonlight, which she goes on to later. Perhaps the link to romance is itself the lie. It could also be argued that, and forgive me with this one, I know this is a bit out there, but I, I like the idea. Uh, since the light of the stars is a light that's travelled for thousands of years, not the light of the object that's in the sky at that moment, the stars represent a false impression, something that seems to be something which it's not. And that could e echo the partner in the poem. Somebody that seems to be one thing, but is actually something very different. Shroud, like several words in the poem, comes from the semantic field of death. The cold could be an emotional cold associated with the death of the relationship. The idea of the shroud being warm makes it seem as if it's been chosen, that the poetic voice has accepted this situation. And the last one I'm going to have a look at with you today. If we take a look at um, this stanza, night clenches it in its fist the moon, a stone, I wish it thrown. I clutch the small stiff body of my phone. These three emotions really kind of dominate aggression, frustration, and there's also a sense of death and lifelessness. The knight's personified because it has a fist. But get a sense of that aggression through the use of the word fist. And again, all of this relates back to the nature of the relationship. There's a sense of aggression, a hurt, a frustration that's evident within it. And it clenches in its fist the moon. The moon, which is no longer a symbol of romance, rather like the stars, but instead just an object, something dead and lifeless, a stone. It's just a dead thing lying in the sky. I wish it thrown. I want to, I want to get rid of it. I clutch the small, stiff body of my phone. Again, an inanimate object is given human characteristics. It's a small, stiff body, but it's, a, it's dead. This phone something that could communicate and provide access to the partner, is itself dead as well. Maybe in the word clutch as well we've got a sense of desperation. She's clinging on, clutching this thing that could provide the link to the partner. Okay, thanks.